Okay. Um, I think we'll start. Um, we still may have some people joining us, uh, both in the room and um, over the internet. This event is being uh, streamed. And for reporters that are joining us um, via the internet, um, there will be an opportunity after opening remarks to ask questions, as well as for those in the room. When we get to the question and answer portion of the news conference, um, I would like to ask anyone who's a member of the press club or a member of the working press to identify yourself by name and your news organization. And um, on behalf of the Newsmaker Committee of the National Press Club, um, we're very honored to have with us today um, the Chief Executive Officer of ICANN, Rod Beckstrom, and the Board Chair, Stephen Crocker. And um, uh, my name's uh, Jamie Horwitz, and um, it's my honor to be here today. And it's funny, when I was coming here today, I was thinking about a conversation I'd had about 20 years ago with a man who was then in his 90s, who had been a, um, a farm boy in Indiana at the time that this press club started 104 years ago. And uh, when I had lunch with him, I asked him, well, in your lifetime, there's been so many changes um, both in technology and in terms of the society, what is the change that had the greatest effect on your life? And, and I, I was surprised he said to me that it was when he was a young boy that Teddy Roosevelt had created rural free delivery and that his family prior to that only went into town in a horse and wagon once a week and got a newspaper once a week and they felt attached to the world once a week. But when they got mail six days a week, it meant they had a, a newspaper come through the mail every day, six days of the week, and with news that was two, three days old. And it's and this building is still here in that time period, but it's amazing how far we've come that a farm boy in Indiana or a child in rural India has really almost infinite reach into news and information. And today um, in our news conference, we're going to talk about really a further expansion of that reach and of news and information. And so. Um, um, I think um, um, our speakers will speak for five or ten minutes. We want to allow a lot of time for questions. And so um, um, with that, why don't I turn it over to you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. And thank you, National Press Club, for this opportunity for us to speak with you. I'll make some brief remarks, and I think maybe Steve will uh, compliment those, round them out, and then we're very happy to take your questions. Uh, ICANN is an international consensus-driven organization that uses a bottom-up policy development process to develop our policies globally. And our commitment is to a globally unified, stable, and secure internet. After six years of intensive development, later today or tomorrow, uh, GMT time, heralds a new era in the domain name system and yet another milestone in the development of the internet with the opening of the third round of generic top-level domains, or what we call new generic top-level domains uh, uh, for the Internet. Uh, this will go online, and applicants from around the world will be able to apply for domain names either in Latin characters or in their own native scripts of different languages. And this is the first time in the history of the Internet that generic top-level domains can be created in non-Latin characters, such as Chinese, Arabic, Devanagari, for the Hindi language, et cetera. Um, uh, it's been developed through very deliberate, very thorough, and exhaustive debates, discussions, and revisions of the community. The applicant guidebook, which is the rule book for the program for its implementation, is over 300 pages in total. We'll be publishing the eighth version of that tomorrow which includes very, very minor uh, uh, clarifications as a result of the questions that have been coming into our, our website online. Uh, we've consulted heavily with governments around the world and received government input for over 80 changes in the program. We were able to accommodate more than 70 of those uh, last year. Uh, and the program is ready to launch from an operational stand, uh, standpoint. The executive team is prepared the operational teams are prepared, including the application processing team. The third-party contractors have all been signed up. The panelists for the review panels uh, uh, have been contracted with, uh, and the technology systems have been developed uh, and tested. 
uh, and uh, uh, we are prepared to launch this program professionally and fairly and objectively, which is our job at ICANN, because we're a technical coordinator for the domain name system, and it's not for us to choose favorites. We will administer the program fairly per the program guidelines that have been published so that any party has a fair chance equal uh, to the quality of their application. Um, uh, we also think that the world is ready for this innovation. Uh, we have traveled through 38 countries collectively over the last four months. I personally have visited 16 and meet, met with the private sector, with governments, with NGOs, different groups to talk about this program. We've had discussions and debates. These were not one-sided presentations, but they were, uh, we often brought parties to the table that had different views about the program. Some liked it, some didn't. That's fine. ICANN's role was never to advocate this program. ICANN's role is to educate and then to implement and then to deliver fairly. Um, but we did learn that there's considerable interest, as you've also noted in the, in the press, uh, and, and controversial uh, with, with some parties and some stakeholders uh, in particular. Um, so why in the wake of intense criticism are we moving ahead? Because we believe that this program will do what it's designed to do which is open up the internet domain name system to further innovation. There are many protections for, uh, in the program to protect various rights holders, including trademark rights holders and businesses, but also other rights and concerns that parties have. Uh, and uh, we think that the competition that offering these new choices offers will help accomplish our mission uh, of creating more consumer choice and competition in the global marketplace. And domain name prices in the GTLD registries have dropped by approximately 70% since ICANN was formed just 12 years ago. That's created significant benefit for users of the Internet around the world. And we certainly hope that this new program will create even more competition uh, on the, in the Internet uh, in the future. And we think it will unleash innovation. Uh, for one thing, even having new top-level domains that are not all in Latin characters uh, is an enhancement to the internet and it will be interesting to see what happens. We certainly have, have heard expressions of, of potential interest informally from, from parties and we'll see what they announce publicly and what they choose to apply for. Uh, some of the protections that are built into this program include criminal background checks for the officers of the organizations that apply for the top level domains. We have a public comment period on all of the strings. So after we collect all the applications from January 12th through April 12th, I'll publish for you and the world to review every single string that's been applied for and who's applied for it. And anyone in the world can comment and can say they object to a string or they find it objectionable or they like it or whatever the comment might be. But it'll be open for public comment. It'll also be open for objections, formal objections, through the panel decision processes where expert panelists outside of ICANN will make the decision on who loses and who wins in those disputes. And if the loser is the applicant, then their application will fail and will not move forward. Um, there's also a trademark clearinghouse that's being created, which is uh, a database where any party that can prove they have government documentation to show they own a trademark or service mark can register it in the database and then be informed in the future if anyone in the world registers their mark at the second level in any of the new top-level domain registries. This has not been done before and is a, a novel and I think important uh, structure and part of the program. We've had uh, multiple bidders to provide those services and we'll be choosing an, outs uh, an, an outsourced service provider soon. Um, there's also a sunrise registration period, which means when a new top-level domain actually comes into the root of the Internet and goes operational, we call it the sunrise. There's a period of time during which trademark holders have a preemptive right to go and register uh, domain names before other parties are allowed into the new registry. Uh, and then there's also, uh, we're utilizing existing uh, dispute resolution processes, as well as introducing new dispute resolution processes uh, in this version of the program. So there's a significant set of protections. It's one of the reasons it's take, taken the community six years to develop and agree upon this program to the point that the board could come and vote on June 20th of last year in Singapore to approve the launch, which occurs tomorrow. 
Uh, there's also limited financial assistance for needy applicants, uh, especially from developing countries. And there was a request that we lower the application fees from $185,000, which covers ICANN's estimated costs. It's a break-even program with, with a separate funding and accounts. Um, and, but the, the request is to lower the fees from $185,000 to $47,000. The ICANN board has agreed to set aside $2 million to support that program. And we're now working out those details based on the public comment that's been received. But we're hoping that will help some needy applicants around the world to be able to participate in the program that might not have been able to otherwise. Um, the application guidebook, I think, as I mentioned, will be published again tomorrow with minor clarifications. But there'll be no, no significant changes or, or new news there. Simply, we'll incorporate the clarifying comments that we've been providing online uh, in the question and answer section of the new GTLD's website. So those are my comments, and Steve? Thank you, Rod. Um, you covered uh, essentially all of the uh, elements, so that's, that's great. I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, Rod focused on the uh, very extensive work in the last six years. Jamie gave a perspective of 100 years, roughly. I want to I choose a couple of points in between those two. Uh, the, the network technology that we're, that we're dealing with was started in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and as we have all experienced, has grown explosively. Um, ICANN is uh, 12 years or so old um, and was started as a consequence of the uh, details that were necessary to uh, manage the explosive growth, uh, one aspect of the explosive growth that comes with the, uh, with the network technology, and that had to do with the uh, management of the domain names, the address space, and the other identifiers that are sort of hold the, um, the core pieces of the network together. We don't have anything to do with the operations. We don't have anything to do with the transport of da actual data. But just sort of the directory structure, if you will, of the names turned out to be an ever-growing uh, picture. Um, we have, uh, you know, by, by various estimates, 2 billion or more users on the Internet, and there's persistent discussion about getting the rest of the human population attached to the network. Um, and so that's a, that's a very interesting position to be in because uh, we, we're now, instead of looking um, at uh, the beginnings or the explosive growth, it's almost as if we're looking at how do we complete the picture and get everybody involved. And in the same fashion, uh, with the domain name system, uh, we've held back for quite a long time on the uh, expansion of the top-level domain system to be very careful with it. We had a couple of earlier rounds that were very uh, uh, limited. And now we're uh, poised to open it up. And again, it's a sense of completing and opening up to be inclusive for everybody. And as Rod uh, emphasized, and I would certainly uh, uh, echo, um, because of the American origins of the Internet uh, and the initial foundations that are all based on the uh, traditional Latin uh, letters and numbers, um, there's been a, a less than uh, uh, complete treatment of other scripts of Chinese, of Arabic, of Cyrillic, of uh, Hindi, and so forth. Um, and uh, uh, one of the attributes of the, this opening that's taking place tomorrow is to embrace not only new top-level domains in the, uh, in the existing environments, but also around the world, so that this is a major step in the globalization of the Internet and a, um, providing a, 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 a equal access and uh, equal uh, invitation, if you will, to users over the entire uh, world. Um, and so that's, that's a, a very positive a step that I think we're all quite excited about. Um, the window opens tomorrow. It stays open for three months. Uh, we've arranged things carefully so that there is no need to have a land rush at the very beginning. Um, so uh, tomorrow is, is, is extremely important. The next important date, if you will, will be the date when the window closes. And then fairly rapidly after that, uh, the world will see how many applications have come in, what names have been chosen, and, uh, and we'll all have a lot more data uh, to uh, look at in this process. Very good. Well, thank you. Um, 
So we're going to move into the question and answer period now. Uh, we have a number of reporters that are on the phone as well as folks in the room. And, and again, just to take care of a couple of housekeeping items. Um, when uh, I recognize you either on the phone or um, in the room, uh, please uh, state your name and your news organization. If you are on, on the phones and, and watching this um, uh, via streaming, uh, rep reporters should hit number three. On, on their phones, pound three, excuse me. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, Mills is in the back of the room there and he has a, a microphone. And so if you're in the room, if you could wait for Mills to hand you uh, the microphone before answering your question so that people who are watching this via the internet will be able to clearly hear your question, that would be helpful. And one last housekeeping item too. Um, uh, especially since we're streaming this and the internet is a good source of advertising events. I just want to point out that tomorrow's newsmaker is at 10 a.m. with um, uh, both uh, Tavis Smiley and Susie Orman here at 10 a.m. Um, <laughs> but having said all that, um, let's um, take some questions. Um, uh, yes, sir. Um, Thank you. My name is David McCauley with Bloomberg BNA. My question, Steve, is for you. It, as you know, the <clears throat> Government Advisory Council has expressed some concern about being overwhelmed by the number of applications and having difficulty in uh, letting their comments be known within an agreed upon 60-day period. And I've seen in the board materials that were posted that there is flexibility expressed on ICANN's part. My question is, how will you exercise flexibility? Is there a formula developed, or how, how will the Government Affairs Advisory Council concerns be addressed? I'll give a brief answer and uh, uh, leave it to Rod to fill in whatever details uh, uh, need to be added. Um, the first most important thing is that we're absolutely committed to working closely and effectively and, and in a very sensible way with the Governmental Advisory Committee. Um, there's estimates of how many uh, applications are going to come in. The 60 days is an estimate of how much time it will take them. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, there's no problem uh, adjusting what the, uh, sorry, let me kill this. Uh, there's no problem adjusting um, the timing and the mechanism and so forth. So as the applications come in, we'll get an estimate of what the size of the problem is as they uh, develop their techniques for processing these. Uh, we'll stay in close co cooperation. So this is really a, a, a refinement among cooperative parties as opposed to an adversarial or a hard problem. And uh, 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 we, we, there's no value in us overwhelming them with applications and then saying you didn't respond. That's a silly position to be in. So it's quite the opposite. And uh, uh, you know something common sense will emerge out of this. Okay. Uh, yes, in the back. Yesterday, I mean, my name is Amy Mushawar. I represent the Association of National Advertisers and Credo, um, a coalition of 160 trade associations and Fortune 1000 companies. Um, yesterday at CSIS, um, excuse, excuse me, um, are you are you a member of the press? Um, no, I'm not. Well, but uh, I, because we give preference to reporters and members of the press club first, so. Um, oh, most certainly. Then so I'll wait. I, I, I would like to, and and th those were my first remarks. So, um, if, sure, if sure. you wouldn't I will mind, I'm um, holding off. Thank wait. you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other reporters or press club members? Uh, yes. Uh, up front here, sorry, Mills. Yes, do I need the mic? Um, yeah, I think so. For the folks that are listening in. I'm Jennifer Martinez from Politico. Um, I think I'm going to ask the question that you were about to ask. Um, it's about ANA's proposal that they put forward this week. Um, I believe there's some concerns um, that people's copyright or trademarks are going to be possibly infringed upon with this new system. So I wanted to see if you um, were going to take the, that proposal into consideration um, and see where that was. I can this, take, is I, your, this is yours. Sure, sure. Um, yes, we received a letter, and, and, we, and we do uh, what we do with letters, which is we post them publicly on our website so that they can inform the policy development process and uh, the community. The ICANN policy development process works through 
the community bodies, particularly there's three organs that develop policies, the ASO, the Address Supporting Organization, the GNSO, the Generic Name Supporting Organization, and then the CCNSO, the Country Code Name Supporting Organization. Those are the three that initiate policy initiatives. And then there's four different advisory groups. We just talked about one, the Governmental Advisory uh, Committee. Um, the place where policy, new policy proposals should come in or amendments to existing policies is through the bottom-up policy development process. That's why we post the letters publicly, and we hope that ANA will continue to engage through the GNSO as they have for years. And in fact, many of their previous suggestions uh, to the GNSO have been incorporated in the policy and in the program. But the CEO of ICANN certainly doesn't develop policy. Um, and uh, it's done through the organization and through community processes. So that's where that would need to be considered. Uh, next question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Nico Pandey from GG Press Japan. Um, Mr. Beckstrom, I was hoping you could expound a little bit more on the dispute resolution panels that you were talking about earlier. Specifically, could you kind of walk us through what happens? I understand there's protections for um, entities who are trying to protect their trademarks. But if through the evaluation process, if there's two or more applicants who are determined to have equally legitimate rights to a particular string, could you tell us how determination is made about which one is granted that string? I think I read in the handbook or the, the manual, the guidebook, sorry, that there was an auction process, but I don't know if that related to what I'm specifically referring to about competing interests or not, so. The, the, the auction process is one of the different mechanisms. So let me try to briefly summarize the program. The program is very complex, and the authoritative document is the, uh, the published applicant guidebook that we're updating tomorrow. There's four different categories of objections. There are objections on intellectual property grounds, such as if someone files for a TLD that doesn't own a trademark for that term and you own that trademark, you can file an objection. There's in, uh, independent uh, IP experts uh, staff that panel. We've developed those uh, procedures as a part of this program and, and published that online. There's uh, objections for limited public interest. T to summarize that loosely, that refers to issues of, of slang or inappropriate language, religion, offensive terms, uh, anything culturally sensitive. There are that's a different panel process to file those objections and have it considered. Uh, there is another objection uh, uh, on community grounds. So if a party says, I, I represent this community of people and we want to apply for dot name, which is a tribe name or something else, then they're going to have to substantiate that. If they're challenged, they will have to prove that. There's a separate set of experts that are used to make those determinations. And then there's also objections based on string confusion. So perhaps you own a brand. Well, what happens if someone else applies for something that looks like your brand with an S added to it? You know, so it's plural. Uh, so uh, that would be an example of, of string contention. But there's other cases of string contentions across, like, Latin string set and Cyrillic. Some things can look the same and similar, and others don't. Uh, so those are the the uh, when and at, after we publish the strings in early May that have been applied for. There's a seven month period of time when anyone uh, any party can file a formal objection. It'll be loser pay. So there's a cost for those out, outside expert panels, um, but anyone can provide a public comment. Uh, so if you've got a set of let's say you have uh, two applicants for the same strings. Uh, if one of them get, loses in one of the objections, they're gone, and it'll go to the other. But let's say they both make it through. Okay, so there might have been objections processes, but they survived. And let's say they passed all of our other checks, the background checks, the financial checks, the technical operation checks. And so they're deemed to be uh, equivalent or valid. We will then notify both parties. You have both passed these initial evaluation steps. Um, and now we encourage you to work out this issue with one another, and we give them a time period. If they work it out, that's up to them. If they cannot work it out, it goes to auction, and the proceeds will go to a charitable cause that will be determined by the community at a subsequent time. It won't go into ICANN general funds. So, and the reason you use a market process is COSA's theorem in economics, which is used in many fields of policy making, and COSA's theorem says that markets are very efficient in allocating resources to the highest, you know, highest social benefit and economic benefit. So there is an auction mechanism. We don't know if it'll ever be used, um, and uh, uh, in some ways we hope it won't be because it'll complicate our lives. We have to set up the structure, handle those funds, and create this different uh, uh, process that would handle that. But so 
That is what happened. Now, let me give you another scenario, though. Let's say you have two applications that come through, and one's from a community and one's from a business. The community application will win. Community applications, which have a slightly, uh, you have to identify that in your application and you have to, to define your community and provide some documentation in support of it, those applications receive preference to what we call standard applications, which can be filed by any other party. So uh, uh, that's a simplified, summarized version of some of the mechanisms for when you have competing applicants for the same string. Great. Um, and we're happy to expand on that outside of this. Thank you. Um, I think what we'll do is go to the phones now and take a question from the phone. Um, uh, Kieran McCarthy, are, are you with us on the phone? Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, can you um, tell us um, where you're calling from and what news organization you're with, please? Sure, it's Kieran McCarthy here from uh, .next. <clears throat> and uh, I have a question. One of, the, one of the biggest concerns that's been raised repeatedly uh, in letters from Congress and in the editorials in the Washington Post and the New York Times and in the letter to ICANN from uh, Secretary Strickland is that of defensive registrations and cyber squatting and the concerns that this will explode with new top lower domains. Now, I, I've never heard ICANN's position on this. I've heard that you said that we have protections in place and we're aware of that, but is your position that these concerns are, are overblown and they simply won't happen? Uh, that the protections are sufficient, or do you view it as, as a, a price worth paying with this uh, expansion of the Internet? Sure. Well, thank you for your question, Karen, uh, about cyber squatting. Clearly, cyber squatting is a, an issue that parties are concerned about today in the domain name space where over 200 million domain names are registered. And, and uh, it's one of, one of the concerns, among others, that has been uh, significantly debated and discussed and, and thought about in this program. And as I mentioned, probably the most exhaustive policy review, comments and revisions have gone into the intellectual property protection components of this program. Uh, and if one defines cyber squatting as parties registering domain names which they don't own so they could get money from trademark owners who do, um, then, uh, then then clearly there are uh, many provisions in this program to help protect trademark owners. There's at least nine components of the program that contribute to the protection of trademark owners that start with the public comment periods and start with the objections uh, process uh, and continue all the way up to the very end, even after we've created, put it something into the root of the Internet, we have something called the PDDRP, or Post Delegation Dispute Resolution Process, which says that if a registry operator is not living up to their agreement and they're allowing abuse to occur in their top-level domain and have showed that repeated tendency, ICANN actually has the right to take that registry back, which has never happened before in the history of the domain name system. We never had that right. We never had that capability. And that was something the community wanted done as, a, as a ultimate enforcement mechanism or incentive to encourage good behavior. So uh, cyber squatting is an issue out there. Out there, It's not going to go away. I think the community has worked hard to develop protections in this program. Uh, and this program has been developed through an open policy development process. Uh, and it can evolve again in the future. Because every applicant also has to acknowledge that ICANN reserves the right to change this program in the future. So if the community develops new mechanisms that it thinks can enhance the program, and there's community agreement and consensus on that that can go up through the community and to the board of ICANN, and if the board approves it, then we'll execute it and, uh, and support it. Very good. Well, let's uh, go back to the room. Uh, yes, sir. Um, Mills, um, do you want to get a mic over there? Thank you. I'm Kit Fox with the Medill News Service, and um, I've talked to a few applicants who have expressed frustration at the changes that have been made to the guidebook, and I just wanted um, to know why those changes were made so recently before the process opens, and kind of just um, understand why, why they were made, basically. Which changes are people concerned about? Um, I know you had an update come out this morning, and they, they just had expressed frustration. Hmm. I. 
I, I would have to hear more specifics. I'm surprised to hear frustration given that it's really only clarifications on aspects of the program, no significant new concept, uh, content. That's not to say that someone uh, uh, isn't upset with some change, but I'm just not aware of, of any changes that would be uh, considered particularly onerous for parties or concerning, but I'm, I'm open to, to hearing specifics, so please, okay. please do share it. Okay, um, next question. Um, uh, uh, before we go back to anyone again, is there anyone who has not asked a question in the room? Uh, um, please, um, let's go back to Bloomberg. It's David McCauley again, Bloomberg BNA. Rod, just to follow up on a point you made on communities having preference between a community and a business, how does trademark figure into that concept? Um, for instance, let's say the community of Oshkosh, Wisconsin wants to get that name, but there's a clothing company that wants the name. How, how does that work? Uh, I'm going to ac actually <laughs> defer to one of my intellectual property experts on, on, on the, the staff. I believe that the community has, has a preference if they can justify that they are a community and they use that name and that name is a part of their identity and that's well documented and historic. Um, but that's a summarized description of what's more, more precise legal language. So in this case, uh, in a simplified sense, I'd say the community uh, would, would win because they are truly a community of Oshkosh. Now, you can't create a brand new community today and call it Oshkosh and have incorporation papers and go put a, you know, some money in it and say, this is now a community and therefore we want to have this uh, uh, because that, that would lead to abuse. So, and that's one of the reasons there's a community objection process is so that there's not an abuse of this, the community privileges that communities receive uh, uh, in the program. Okay. Um, well, let's see. Um, are, is that Brad? Is that? Well, yeah. We have some. Uh, um, we have a we have a question from um, Germany. Um, uh, Monica, um, are you on the phone? Yes. Um, Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Um, can you further identify yourself? By the way, uh, can you tell us who you're with, please? No, we're good. Okay. okay. I'm with Heise Online in Germany. Um, I have a question on the IANA contract provision. Uh, there has been talk about adding a new clause uh, that would make uh, IANA uh, to do additional checks before they enter a new TLV to the route. What is the status of the IANA contract and of this clause especially? The IANA contract is currently out for bid, and the, uh, the contract itself and that the bid rules specify that any parties that might be participating in that process are, are not to be discussing it uh, publicly, so I have no comment. Okay. Um, are there any other questions over the, um, over the phone? If not, we'll go back to the room. Okay, well then, um, any questions from any reporters um, in the room? I think um, if we don't have any other questions, then we'll probably end the, pre the formal portion of the press conference here, and then anyone that wants to ask questions of our speakers, I'm sure they'll be more than willing to stick around and answer some questions. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who's uh, been watching online and, and joining us by phone, as well as everyone who came out today. And especially I want to thank our guests for joining us. And um, on behalf of the National Press Club, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.